one of the uh, great advantages, of course, of living in a uh, federal state is that one can draw uh, interesting uh, comparisons uh, between the activities uh, at the provincial level and at the, uh, at the federal level. And uh, we thought it would be uh, useful in uh, these final sessions to, to look at uh, judicial review uh, in the federal and the provincial courts on something of a, a comparative, uh, comparative basis. And uh, what we will uh, be having is an initial uh, presentation uh, by uh, Madam Justice uh, Alice Desjardins, uh, followed by a panel discussion. And if we can squeeze in the time, I hope we'll be able to have a, uh, a some time at least for, uh, for some questions and comment from the, uh, from the, from the floor. Uh, I will now uh, introduce the principal uh, speaker, uh, Madam Justice uh, Alice Desjardins. Uh, Alice has had a distinguished uh, career uh, is now on the um, Federal Court of Canada Appeal Division and also on the Court Martial Appeal Court of, uh, of Canada. She uh, was appointed to the bench after a career in the Justice Department and I would, if I could take a moment uh, to be a little bit uh, personal, say that I was delighted years ago on a sabbatical in, uh, in Ottawa when, I, when she was still at the Justice Department uh, to uh, meet and uh, talk extensively on administrative law matters all those years again. And it's, uh, of course, particularly delightful <laughs> to have uh, Alice with us uh, uh, today. Um, she uh, was, in fact, in teaching, uh, which perhaps was the reason why a, a lonely academic found uh, a delightful person to speak to at the uh, Justice Department, whether my, uh, I stay there, as you can see from the outline of her. Uh, 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 a biography in the, uh, in, the, in the materials. We then have uh, three uh, commentators. On my uh, far left is uh, Gordon Henderson, a uh, senior practitioner uh, in, this, uh, in this, uh, this area, appointed Queen's Counsel in uh, 1953, and uh, it tells me here with assurance that he is certified as a specialist in civil litigation. I'm sure that wasn't the least bit uh, necessary, but it tells me that. He is uh, an officer of the uh, Order of, uh, of Canada and a life bencher of uh, this uh, law society. And uh, as an academic, I'm particularly pleased to, uh, to note that on April the 1st, 1991, he was appointed Chancellor of the uh, University of, uh, of Ottawa. To my immediate left is uh, uh, the Honorable Robert uh, Reed, who until quite recently was on the uh, Ontario um, uh, court and uh, very active in the divisional court in administrative law matters after a, an extensive career in, uh, in private practice. And he is now back in private practice with the Tor uh, Toronto firm of Tablinski and Colson. He has for, taught administrative law for many years He's published a book that's very uh, useful to us still in administrative law, Thank unfortunately you. a little bit uh, uh, dated, yeah, that's right. <laughs> but on the other hand, he makes up with a very timely publication, which is, uh, which is a very great use of Reed's Administrative Law, which is a, a very uh, a current account of uh, developments in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in administrative law. And finally, it's my particular pleasure to introduce uh, D. Gordon Blair uh, at the Ontario uh, Court of Appeal. Uh, Gordon was a, uh, a Rhodes Scholar, among other uh, fine uh, achievements, a practitioner in the area of uh, regulation. Uh, I ran across him in the days when he represented PWA, when it was in significantly happier shape than it, uh, than it is now, being a practitioner before the old Canadian uh, Transport Commission. And again, I'm, I'm pleased to record uh, how kind and supportive Gordon was for work that I was doing at the time for the Law Reform Commission of Canada on the CTC when the Canadian Transport Commission uh, felt that it was licensed magistas for anybody to dare to ask any questions about how they, how they operated, and Gordon was delightfully uh, supportive. So we have a principal speaker with an extensive involvement in the federal court and federal administrative uh, law matters. We have three very experienced uh, uh, commentators, and I'm sure we'll have a, a, a very uh, interesting uh, session uh, on the, in the area of, uh, of comparative aspects of uh, federal and provincial uh, 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 judicial, uh, judicial review. And at this stage, I would like to ask uh, Madam uh, Justice uh, Alice uh, Desjardins to, uh, to give us the uh, principal um, uh, talk uh, today.
Good evening. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. The, the origin of, of the Federal Court of Canada as we know it today rests with the decision of the Supreme Court a number of years ago in the Three of River Boltman's case. And the, the obvious result of that decision was to subject decisions of federal boards having effect across the land to possible conflicting decisions by provincial uh, superior courts. But the Supreme Court of Canada in that case stated that the Parliament of Canada could confer the superintending and reforming powers of the, superi of the, the superior courts to a court it could establish under Section 101 of the Constitution Act of 1867. The, it was felt, therefore, that this court should be created it, uh, and that its writs should have effect across Canada, and thus the Federal Court of Canada was born. The paragraph 18, section 18, as a matter of fact, of the Act uh, transferred the superintending power from the provincial superior courts to the Federal Court of Canada. But at the same time, there's a line of cases which says that it does not, it did not de deprive provincial superior courts of their jurisdiction to determine the constitutional validity and applicability of legislation. And, and no doubt we will hear quite a lot more about this due in particular to the recent decision of the Court of Appeal of Ontario in the RISA case, uh, which is an immigration case. In the 1971 version of the Federal Court Act, paragraph 18 gave jurisdiction to the trial division uh, over the uh, traditional remedies of certiorari prohibition, mandamus, and co warranto, uh, together with injunction and declaratory relief. But the Act created a new section with a new remedy, which was section 28, which is an application for review and to review and set aside. Um, to the appeal division of the, of the court. That section, section 28, had precedence over section 18, and it also had an overriding effect over all privative clauses. It started with the words, notwithstanding any other act. It was certainly interpreted largely by uh, judges of my court as um, therefore allowing for uh, intervention of the court when there was a pure error of law made by these federal boards and tribunals. Uh, with the exception, of course, of the Canada Labor Code, because that, uh, the old section 122 was very special with the, in relation to the Canada Labor Relations Court. So the Federal Court of Canada is not a superior court. Um, it is, uh, uh, sorry, it is not, it, it is a superior court by statute, but it does not have the inherent powers that superior courts do have because they are the real su successors of the royal courts of justice. But uh, it's a court through um, jurisprudence, through the case law, has developed what we call implied powers, for instance, state orders, and jurisdiction over our own process has been developed as being part of implied powers. You, you all well know, I'm, I'm sure, that in February 1992, that's less than probably five or six months ago now, we, we do have a number of, of uh, very important amendments to the Federal Court Act. Um, and my, as, a preview, as a preliminary assessment, and I will develop these points as I go, um, it is my view that while it, uh, these amendments po possibly diminish the caseload of the court in processing in proceedings against the Crown, they, however, enhance the jurisdiction of the court in judicial review, particularly uh, with the additions of new grounds of intervention. Um, at the same time, they limit the power of both divisions to what is now known as the test of patent unreasonableness. And the appeal divisions, for its part, under the new amendments, is in a <coughs> peculiar position because it's sort of a, both an appellate court and to a certain extent it, it will act sometimes as, as a court of first instance. There is, according to a recent count, about 120 of these various boards and commissions. Uh, we, they enjoy a considerable uh, non-reviewable powers except for judicial review and appeal. Now the hallmark of an appeal is that it goes to the merit of the case and the court there is concerned with the correctness of the decision. The level of error in case of a, an appeal is lower than in a case of a ju judicial review. In an appeal, the, the um, error of, is one of the error of law where in, the, in a matter of judicial review it is 
the notion of patent unreasonableness. And of course, when an appeal lies, is available to a party, judicial review is excluded. Judicial review, on the other hand, as you well know, is concerned, and Mr. Justice Laffer was recalling this yesterday, is concerned with the decision-making process. And the federal court of Canada, when we come to judicial review matter, our power is therefore to set aside and return. We have the power to set aside return with direction, which really sometimes amounts to tell the board what it ought to do and how it ought to decide. But still, we cannot decide in <coughs> place of that board. And the reason why I, I recall these um, very, very statements that I'm sure everybody knows about the difference between an appeal and a judicial review proceeding is because federal legislation, in my view particularly, it may be true also for Ontario, but in federal legislation, both appeals and judicial view, review are intertwined very closely. And the examples I give in my, my paper are, are taken from unemployment insurance uh, in the um, Unemployment Insurance <coughs> Act, but also in the Immigration <coughs> Act. And it's very important because uh, sometimes we have provisions which are marked appeal, but in fact the grounds of appeal are exactly the grounds of the judicial review. And uh, therefore, the powers of the court and, and the, tr the, the level of their and the powers of the court are very different from one to the other. And therefore, uh, judges and counsel, when they are before us, they must concentrate at all times upon the precise nature of the recourse which is brought before the court, particularly since both the remedy and the lev level of errors are different. And imagine it's very different if someone at the, at the end has said, well, you have to return before the board. Uh, to have that decision being taken uh, instead of saying, well, the court decides and that is the matter that the, from now on the decision is the following. Uh, nearly from the time of its, in, uh, of its creation in 1971, the federal court and its empowering statute have been the subject of much criticism. And these criticism related particularly to two main areas. Um, it was first the confusion contained by the allocation of jurisdiction between the trial division and the Court of Appeal. And secondly, there were problems pertaining to the grounds of judicial review and the redress available. With regard to the confusion, it's, it's a famous uh, difficulty between the 18 and the section 28. The problem was, was therefore of deciphering between an administrative decision which would be reviewed only by the trial division and the judicial and quasi-judicial decision which would be reviewable only by the Court of Appeal. It is somewhat ironic that at the same time that the Supreme Court of Canada was setting forward the test for determining whether a decision was made on a judicial or quasi-judicial uh, basis, and the Court did that, as you remember well, in the Coopers and Librans case, uh, it was also recognizing the difficulty in distinguishing between judicial, quasi-judicial, and administrative decision in the uh, Nicholson case. Therefore, this classification of administrative, judicial, and quasi-judicial ceased to be important before the provincial superior courts, but it had to be maintained at the federal level in order to distinguish before which division of the court a party ought to address to, uh, itself. Uh, and uh, interestingly enough, do so in Borgia in their book on administrative law, they note that had not the case law developed uh, in, and uh, broadened the ambit of review to encompass decisions of purely administrative nature, the notwithstanding clause of Section 28 would have operated to concentrate the supervisory and reform powers over federal agencies, particularly before the, court, the Federal Court of Appeal. Now, other problems beside that 1828 situation, other problems before the amendments of 1992 had to do with the fact that the trial division was, um, had jurisdiction to um, vis the traditional rem remedies plus injunction and declaration. But the grounds of, of review were not spelled in Section 18. And among the other difficulties were the fact that uh, the prerogative writs uh, had to be taken by, by reasons of a notice uh, of motion, while the um, injunction and the declaratory relief had to be taken by way of a, a, um, a writ of summons. And we had a rule, Rule 603, as I call, which has now been abolished, 
but would make sometimes life very difficult for the, those who came to plead before us. The, the problem with the old Section 28 was that it was not, some felt the enumer enumeration, and you re remember that was a famous Section 28, 1, A, B, and C, that that was not enough. It did not encompass enough um, grounds of intervention to ensure a proper development of mm -hmm. judicial review. And it was also felt that um, since mandatory and prohibitory orders were not available on, under Section 18, the Federal Court of Appeal was limited in its type of relief it could grant. Now, Bill C-38, which is now the, these new amendments uh, in force uh, since uh, February 1st, 1992, um, has remedied the problem of deciphering between administrative judicial or quasi-judicial. There is one question to be asked, and it's a very easy one, and that question is to decide which tribunal has rendered the decision. Once you know and which tribunal has rendered the, the, the decision, the rest is simply to check in the new section 28, and there is there an enumeration of boards. In my paper, I mentioned there are 14 <coughs> boards. At the moment, there are 18, so make sure that uh, what you have in front of you is just the draft, my draft paper. By the time I was finishing drafting it, they proclaimed two new acts with two new boards added to the list, and they all come under this letter small o. So probably that, that was surely simply a, a mistake in drafting, and later on we will surely have, see an amendment which will bring one under small o and the other one under small p. <coughs> and these two boards, these two additional tribunals, you may have never heard of them, one are the assessors appointed under the Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation Act, and the other is the Canadian Artist and Producers Professionals Relations Tribunal which was established by the Status of Artists Act. But the rationale of these enumerated boards is exactly the same as it was under the original uh, Bill C-38. It has to do with boards who are either courts of records or boards who um, are the members of which um, are e judges. Now, under the new act, therefore the new amendments, the statutory appeals from tribunals, they are now to be heard um, before the trial division unless the act specifies otherwise. This later, uh, latter provision constitute an interesting reversal from the former um, provisions of, of the act where, where statutory appeals uh, for, from board's decision used to go to the appeal division first unless uh, mentioned in the legislation. And the, the rationale of this provision is therefore that uh, to bring before the trial division um, both statutory appeals and judicial review, principally, I should say, with the exception, of course, in the review of the enum enumerated list in section 28. Now, references. Um, I, I don't know to what extent all the various court of appeal in the country are permitted to, to um, to receive or to entertain references, but in our legislation, boards may refer certain matters to the to the courts when if they have a a problem of law which they want to, they want a clear direction. Well, references under the new system um, is um, is to be addressed to the tribunal, which is either on the list of the section 28 or the unenumerated uh, list of, sec of of section 18. But there is a new provision which allows the attorney general at any stage of the proceeding before a board um, to refer a matter to either, to, uh, sorry, to the trial division. So it's quite different in this case because it's the attorney general who, re who is uh, authorized to refer the matter and not the board, which is what I was telling you a moment ago. But um, before the amendments, all references were directed directly to the Court of Appeal. And, and since an appeal lies to the Court of Appeal from a decision given by the trial division on a reference, and since a reference is a matter to be dealt with expeditiously, I think only time will tell whether the new system constitute an improvement over the old one. I said a moment ago that the, the appeal division uh, under the new amendments finds itself into what I call a peculiar situation because 
it will sometimes operate as a court of first instance vis-a-vis -vis the enumerated 16 boards because now we will be called upon to hear matters like injunctions and declaratory reliefs, matters which we did not have before because, because they came under the, the original um, jurisdiction of, of the trial division. But so because of that, and particularly I suppose in case of emergencies, we may have an injunction taken against a, one of the federal boards, um, I will, it will be a challenge for our court and we will develop, I suppose, our jurisprudence as we go because that's the best way to do it. Um, as to how we will be collecting that evidence, certainly the, most of the time I think we'll probably proceed by affidavit and cross-examinations on. But um, I, I suppose that it may not be impossible, like viva voce evidence, like directing an issue, uh, or uh, asking a single judge of the Court of Appeal to make a determination after the reception of viva voce evidence. Or, there's a bunch of things, there are a number of, of ways that we will need to explore on account of this sort of dual situation that we will find ourselves. Now there is the provision in the new amendments that allow the trial division to direct that an application for judicial review be treated and proceeded with as an action. That is a legislative response to the concern that was expressed in some of the cases prior to February 1st, 1992, to the effect that an application for judicial review did not provide the, the appropriate safeguards uh, where declarative relief was sought, because of course with there is in an application for judicial review there is no, no such thing as examinations on discoveries and filing of a defense. Which, uh, so the trial division now has this, this power to redirect or to, to make sure that an application for judicial review can be heard as if it were an action. But this power, this provision does not apply to the appeal division. I'd like now to point out some of the highlights of the new amendments. One is that the definition of a federal board commission or tribunal has been widened to, um, to encompass uh, persons or powers or bodies which exercise powers uh, under the royal prerogative. Now the pro royal prerogative is a sort of a delicate matter and I think we stand in today as, as Markland did stand in 1888 when he wrote uh, about the royal, the, about the prerogative that our, our course, as I cite Maitland, our course is set about with difficulties, with prerogative disused, with prerogatives of doubtful existence, with prerogative which exists by sufferance, merely because no one has thought is it worthwhile to abolish them. And they are uh, traditionally a number of prerogatives we all know both in the legislative field, in the judicial field, stay of proceedings are one, in the legislative field, things like the prorogation of the houses, the dissolution of the house, and of course in the, in the, um, in the um, executive field, which is the one we're concerned here, I, I, I'm pretty sure. And um, there, but there's one uh, that lately was sort of recognized by our court, and I salute it because I think it's a very Canadian one, and the British um, authors could not be citing that one, and that is the prerogative of, of that, that the executive has in inviting um, to constitutional conferences where discussions are being held for a future a constitutional amendment, which is different from the, from the moment it comes to a, a resolution which might be adopted because at one stage it, it be, may be part of the le legislative process, a process of which the courts do not have any handle on, so they have there to stop and particularly defer to what the legislation, the legislative powers are doing. But uh, that uh, prerogative, the one to, to invite an invitation to attend constitutional review meetings for discussions, is a very Canadian one that I, we may, may hear more as we go on that one. <laughs> Hopefully, or not, or you, I'm not in a position to. I, I heard the comment of David yesterday, which I thought was very amusing and very interesting. Um, with the, the new amendments, you will note that section 28, now the words, notwithstanding any other act, 
which we thought for many years was giving us this power to, to ignore privative clauses adopted both before and after the adoption of the Federal Court Act. Well, the words notwithstanding any other act now uh, do not appear anymore. Um, I'm sure that this, this deletion corresponds to the recent decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada, both in the PSR uh, A case, which I call the Econosult case, and the one of the National Corn Growers Association case, where the court, without even referring to these words notwithstanding any, any <coughs> other act, and to our jurisprudence, nonetheless came to the conclusion that we, that the correct test before our court was one of patent unreasonableness. Therefore, we stand at this stage in exactly the same situation of, as all the other courts in Canada in terms of we judicial review is, is um, in, in matters of error of law is, 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 is to face the test of the patent unreasonableness. Now, with the new amendments, uh, we, we, the, 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 um, there is one procedure, which is the application for judicial review. And you don't have to worry about whether it goes by notice of the proceeding that now are set by our new rules, which are under Rule 1600 of the Federal Court rules. Um, I, I told you a moment ago that our grounds of, for judicial intervention have been widened, and I just want to highlight some of those that I, are newer, and just to sort of because I think they are the ones that um, are the most interesting ones. Under the new ones, um, for instance, we, there is a, po a possibility of intervention um, when the board failed to observe procedural fairness, and that is largely according to the jurisprudence and the development in administrative law, but it adds or other procedure required by law to observe. And uh, certainly among the possibilities are the fact that if a board does not follow its own internal procedure, the, uh, the courts will be able to intervene in judicial review. A and I would think if the uh, board does not uh, uh, apply <coughs> properly the doctrine of legitimate expectation, that would be a procedure required by law to observe of which a board would not have observed and which might be a ground for a possible intervention. Uh, one other ground addition is the one of fraud of, or perjured evidence. And usually matters of fraud are, are more properly be dealt with through an action. But uh, in this case, we will have uh, um, this power to intervene and either affidavits or, or something else or perhaps direction of an issue or something will have to be dealt when the matter comes before the, directly to the Court of Appeal. Uh, an interesting addition is the, the one when the board acted in any other way that was contrary to law. Now, it's been suggested, and I think it was by Whitehall and Smiley in some of their comments earlier before the Canadian Bar, that uh, that uh, power of intervention, that ground of intervention, uh, would permit the court, the reviewing court, to determine whether a given decision is contrary to the charter, and particularly where the tribunal is without jurisdiction to determine uh, charter questions. Now, I, um, I have one comment on that one. There's certainly the possibility that it be like that, but I think it should be uh, reflected upon um, in, the, um, in, the, in the light of the decision of the Supreme Court in Tetrogaduri. Because in Tetrogaduri, what the Supreme Court of Canada held was that an administrative tribunal does not have jurisdiction to entertain a question of law, and therefore a question to deal with the charter. So when it's, it's empowering, uh, the statute does not give it to it. So that where that happens, said the Supreme Court of Canada, the Federal Court of Appeal is without jurisdiction to decide that constitutional law question. And remember in Tetro Gadori, uh, the claimant, Madame Gadori, went directly from the Board of Referees to the Federal Court of Appeal. And in that case, um, I remember very well because I sat in Tetro Gaderi and, and what I said, and I, I was undoubtedly reversed by the Supreme Court on that point, I expressed the opinion that if the, if the Board of Referees had no jurisdiction to pronounce upon the Charter, the Federal, the federal Court of Appeal did so. 
But, but the Supreme Court reversed me, and they cite in the approval Marceau, in uh, my colleague Marceau J.A., in, in the case of Poirier, where Marceau said the following, and, and it's, it's cited by the Supreme Court of Canada. The court said, um, citing Marceau, the court cannot pronounce itself on a question which did not face the administrative authority, nor order the authority to answer one way or another a question which is not of its concern. The very nature of the recourse determine its limitations and the procedural rules which govern it, um, an application which must be heard and determined without delay and in a summary way, directly reflects those limitations. Therefore, whether this new provision, this new ground, when it says acted in any other way that was contrary to law, whether that new addition allows the reviewing court to straighten the law that the tribunal did not have the power to do in the first place, uh, and whether that constitutes remedial legislation will be very interesting to see as we go. The reliefs um, which are uh, permitted or given to our court, both divisions under the new amendments, have been widened to what was the, the one certainly in the old section 28, um, and the old section uh, 52, particularly be because now we, all these reliefs are, are bundled together in, in the application for judicial review. But we don't have power to, to issue damages. But um, I note the, just that the British have started to, to in, indulge in what they call the prospective declarations. But I have the impression that since Schachter, we may be having, well, uh, we may be starting to indulge in the possibility of having prospective declarations because in Schachter, as you will remember, Schachter got nothing out of that exercise but because um, the, the, unemploy the um, Unemployment Insurance Act was amended um, retroactive to September 3rd, 1988, and his problem, his child um, was born in the uh, 1985, and that was the year where he had, he had asked for these uh, um, uh, compensation, these benefits. So, so in a way, we may be going without knowing in the area of prospective de declarations. Um, in, in conclusion, I stress a bit the, the tensions the, the, um, or the, um, the trends that remains with both the federal court and the provincial superior courts, the tension between judicial activism and curial deference. And I give certain examples in my paper, and no doubt in the comments we'll have an occasion to deal with that a little bit more. But I was interested to, to look at, again, at to what the British court had been doing. In, in the field in order to, to see how much uh, may be coming up in, in our courts too. And the British, of course, at the moment, they, they do have this power to intervene uh, when a decision is being given under the royal prerogative. But they also have started to, to uh, intervene in areas of non-statutory self-regulatory bo boards, such as the uh, takeover panel, which uh, in the city is uh, charged with the inter interpreting the, the code on takeovers. Um, in some of the British commentators, and I cite here Lord Justice Wolfe, go even further, and they think that court now should come and, and sort of have a power or should exercise judicial review power over certain large corporations, particularly in our area of privatization. Um, his theory is, would be that a lot of these boards exercise de facto public powers by opposition to de jure public powers. We, of course, uh, in our court could not do that because our act is very clear that the federal, the definition of federal board encompasses th those that are, that are constituted by statutes. So it, it is very clear, therefore, that we, we could not or we could not intervene in case of non-statutory self-regulatory bodies. And, and I just want one final remark because I'm the only one in this, on this panel who deals with, with federal legislation. And simply to, to uh, remind you what you know very well is that we, we, we must handle federal legislation with the two versions, the two official versions of the English and the French one. Um, and we do appreciate, or I for one, appreciate when counsel in their memorandums to us 
uh, bring both versions and not only a typed one or you know, either language because all the time when you make your argument or when, you pre when we read in preparation for your case, we have the duty to look at the two versions. And it's extraordinary the amount of help that sometimes one version brings to the other. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Alice. Uh, I'm now going to uh, call on uh, Gordon Blair as the uh, first of our, uh, our, our commentators. Well, first of all, I, I would like to thank uh, Madam Justice Desjardins for her very comprehensive and interesting paper. Uh, I've had the privilege of reading it some time ago, and it's been instructive to me. And I speak rather personally about this subject because I feel I was present at the creation of the federal court in 1970. And perhaps some background might be of interest. And before that time, I had practiced for many years in Ottawa, principally before the federal tribunals. And I first met uh, my friend Gordon Henderson, I think, at the Tariff Board many years ago. At that time, there was no federal provision or no provision for review of tribunal decisions at the federal level. But somewhere out in the wilderness was the feeling that it might be done at the uh, provincial level. One time, I went down can I be heard better now? One time I went down to Bathurst, New Brunswick for an air transport board hearing and we all convened a huge crowd in the courtroom and learned counsel for, for my opponent stood up and waved a piece of paper, a next party order of prohibition which he'd obtained from a New Brunswick judge. Well, we got back there after fairly expensive and extensive proceedings in the New Brunswick courts around a year later, and I must say that was one of the fastest decisions that the Air Transport Board ever gave, and guess in whose favor. <laughs> the, uh, at that time, the governing, the governing legislation for most tribunals provided for appeals with leave on a question of law or jurisdiction to the Supreme Court. And of course, those words look a little like the grounds on which applications for review have been made. But leave was rarely given, and as far as I know, between the end of the war and the creation of the federal court, only on one occasion did the Supreme Court of Canada upset a decision of a federal tribunal. This was explained to me once by Mr. Justice Abbott after I had had the temerity to make an application for leave which succeeded and to have it argued in the Supreme Court. He said, Gordon, it, you did pretty well, but you should know something. He said, the board is made up of experts. We won't interfere with them. Well, we might if we found them committing unnatural acts on a public street. <laughs> so. Now, <clears throat> the, my experience with the federal tribunals, as they were then, has unquestionably colored my view of administrative law. I must say, with respect to Margot Priest, that I didn't think of them as tribunals from hell at all. They were well-manned tribunals. They commanded their respect of the industries that they regulated and the council who appeared before them. And this gave me a, an impression, which I've had for a long time, that there's a vast difference between the administrative law of the tribunals and the administrative law of the courts. Having expressed this view once in a lecture at Queen's, which was reported, I, it led to my very long and 
rewarding friendship with Hudson Janish, who uh, tends to look as I do through the right end of the telescope at, at these the decisions. Now, at some stage, the uh, system in Ottawa had to change. They just it was impossible to even think of the Supreme Court of Canada becoming the ultimate arbiter in administrative law, or the, the arbiter. And uh, in 1970, the Federal Court Act, <clears throat> the Federal Court was created essentially giving to the former Exchequer Court the powers of review, which uh, <clears throat> it now has. They com at that time, I happened to be a member of Parliament and a member of the Justice Committee of the House of Commons. And the complexities of the old act, to which Madame Desjardins, Justice Desjardins has referred, were very apparent to us. And there was a, an attempt to try to clarify it, but for reasons which I never could quite understand, the government resisted attempts to amend the bill, and it was passed in the form it was presented. And at one time, I, my name got into the headlines of the Ottawa papers because I described the uh, system in the act as a legal jigsaw puzzle. It, it is very much, I think, to the credit of the Federal Court of Appeal in particular that it has been able to administer the act and make sense of it, and it, it has, I hope, been made a lot easier for them by the recent amendments, because they face the immense burden of uh, presiding over federal legislation, which, as we all know in the case of immigration, presents very peculiar and difficult problems to them. Now, here I would like to make a few comments on Ontario legislation. If anybody is following me with my paper, I'm just going through it chronologically and I hope abbreviating it a little bit. Um, it, approximately a year after the Federal Court Act was passed, the legislation in Ontario was amended or changed by the passage of the Judicial Review of Procedure Act and providing, as you all know, a single procedure for dealing with prerogative writs, simplifying the procedure, eliminating all the difficulties from the prerogative, their prerogative characters and making it possible to review decisions of administrative tribunals by a simple notice of application for review. The, uh, these uh, review applications are heard by the divisional court of three members of the High Court, as it then was, now the General Court of Ontario, and in the case of urgency, with leave by a single member of the court. The decisions of the div divisional court may be appealed with leave of the Court of Appeal to the Court of Appeal. I'm going to leave to my friend <coughs> Bob Reed the task uh, of uh, explaining what the divisional court does. The, if you look at page four of my, my paper, uh, you will note that there, by the time these applications get winnowed down at the Court of Appeal level, very few get there, and of those few that do, uh, still a still lower percentage succeed. Uh, Bob Reed, as you know, has made a tremendous contribution to the development of administrative law in this province, and we will all benefit from his comments on it. The federal and Ontario, court, uh, and Ontario courts adhere to the same general principles of administrative law. But it is too bad that there is no real citation of the judgments of one court in the other 
they develop independently, connected, I guess, indirectly by reason of the decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada from both courts. Um, <coughs> And I, this is explicable in part by the fact that administrative law decisions tend to be statute specific. There is one important change which has occurred since the preparation of this paper. I was able to see, say, as you might note from the last sentence on page four, that it was important to record that the policy of the Ontario Court of Appeal was to respect the jurisdiction of the federal court as a matter of comedy and to refrain from interfering with its judgments or indeed with its jurisdiction. Well, as you've been told several times in the course of these proceedings, a very recent judgment of the Court of Appeal in the case of Reza, that's R-E-Z-A -E versus the Queen, this uh, policy has been set aside or at least uh, reduced in its importance. This was a case where uh, an application was made to the Ontario court on constitutional grounds, on the grounds of interference with charter rights to stay in order of deportation. And the argument made uh, by the crown, uh, crown was that this is something which should be dealt with by the federal court because of its uh, intense involvement with immigration matters, but uh, our court, uh, in a divided decision, decided that was not true and uh, proceeded to grant the relief. Madam Justice Arbour wrote, wrote the judgment and Madam Justice Abella uh, produced a dissenting judgment. And it will, I have the impression this may go further. <laughs> I'll say no more about it. <laughs> now, here we've been engaged in, for 20 years, in an extensive exercise of judicial review. Uh, in an article which is noted in a footnote to Madam Justice Desjardins' paper, Sir William Wade has described uh, judicial review as the great legal growth industry of the last part of the 20th century. And it seems to me there is a time to do some stock taking. And there are a number of questions which I suggest might be considered. And here I turn to page five of my uh, paper and I'll read one paragraph because I don't think we have really got a handle on what has been accomplished uh, by this immense exercise in judicial, judicial review. Quantitatively, can we determine the number of administrative decisions reviewed? What percentages have been overturned? What types of administrative decisions have been challenged? Or what, what types are most likely to be challenged? Qualitatively, what has been the effect of judicial review on administrative decisions? Have they improved? If so, can this be demonstrated? Have the administrative tribunals paid any significant attention to judicial decisions on administrative law? Are significantly more administrative decisions now made in writing and with greater care? And then I think that we should consider the negatives connected with judicial review. The most obvious, of course, is the additional cost and delay, which maybe tip is typified by the DACO case, which I refer to in footnote 18 of my, uh, my paper. Here, this was a case where in January of 1985, a factory in Ontario was closed and taken and, and moved to Mexico. That has a more topical ring now. <laughs> uh, the, bef under the old collective agreements, 
retirees were entitled to the benefits in terms of improved health and similar benefits included in any collective agreement. Immediately, the agreement was terminated. The uh, company ceased paying benefits to 50 retirees. Uh, it was this dispute went to arbitration where the arbitrator ruled in favor of the retirees. It came to the divisional court where the, co <coughs> the court decided in favor of the company. It came to our court where we decided <coughs> in favor of the retirees. It was then appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada and the decision, the case was heard in June the decision is still pending. Well, that's seven years. And I wonder how many of those 50 retirees are still around. <laughs> <laughs> this is a, but my major concern, however, was that somewhere between the time that this paper was written and my presentation of it, the Supreme Court would make its decision. I, I really think that what it says in this decision will deal with some of the problems which all of us are, have been having with the recent decisions of the Supreme Court in, the, in relation to review. Uh, I would, and I was heartened yesterday to hear uh, Mr. Justice Laforé say that it was possible to uh, reconcile all these decisions. This, this would come as a somewhat of a surprise to the academic community, and it, it, but it, it gives a little curry encouragement to people like myself. Uh, well, I don't think that it's appropriate for me to say too much more about uh, the, the present state of affairs uh, and to comment on the issues raised by these decisions except to say that they deal with a problem which is continual in administrative law. And that problem is simply when can, when should courts interfere with the decisions of administrative tribunals? I think that courts are limited in the end by their own sense of self-restraint and we have Justice LaForge yesterday pointed to the fact that the pendulum had swung from excessive interference in the 50s and 60s to restraint and a regime of when uh, courts were disposed to not interfere, to grant what is called curio deference. And Justice Abbott's definition of Curial deference has not yet made its way into the textbooks. Uh, the, uh, I don't want to take too much of your time, but and I think that I, I probably have made my point that it is the important question, the most important question in administrative law remains, as it has for a long time, whether and to what extent courts will interfere with administrative decisions. And I hope that that may occupy some of our time and discussion this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Gordon. Uh, now, just following down our list in, uh, in alphabetical order, I will uh, call on uh, Gordon, uh, Gordon Henderson. Uh, thank you, Hudson. Uh, the first time I've ever been introduced as having been certified, by the time I'm finished, you may, you may feel that I ought to be. <laughs> uh, in any event, I approach this uh, particular subject with a certain amount of trepidation because in 1970, before the Federal Court Act was uh, brought into force, I made a very extensive presentation to this body 
which made such an impact on the subject that it never got referred to in any paper and it was never referred to in any judicial decision. <laughs> so uh, uh, these comments are, are made with uh, uh, some concern. But I'm going to comment particularly on an aspect of uh, Madam Justice Desjardins' paper because uh, uh, as she pointed out, she was in a position where she was not able to uh, deal with what I think is a very significant part of administrative law, and uh, uh, that is the role of the federal court. There has been some criticism far away places as to whether there ought to be one. What my burden of what I want to say to you is, yes, there should be one for uniform decision making relating to federal boards and commissions. Now I'm going to do this in terms of um, uh, the difficulty that arises where you get different decisions from different provincial jurisdictions in relation to the same tribunal, in relation to the same issue. Uh, the tribunal that I'm going to deal with is the chief electoral officer. The issue is prisoners' right to vote. Now, what happened historically is that in 9, March 12, 1986, the Manitoba Court of Queen's Bench said prisoners have the right to vote. My paper, Badger versus AG Manitoba. Uh, based on Section 3 of the Charter. So we have, yes, they can vote. November 7, 1988, in terms of voting at a federal election, the Ontario Court, General Division, by, through Mrs. Madam Justice Van Camp, prisoners do not have the right to vote. Sove versus the Attorney General. Uh, and now we have yes and no. Now the matter didn't end there. Each court of appeal reversed its own judge, trial judge. <laughs> so now no becomes yes and yes becomes no. Reminiscent of something or other? <laughs> in any event, any event, the Manitoba Court of Appeal decision in terms of voting at federal elections was November 18, 1988. Prisoners do not have the right to vote. They preferred Madam Van Camp's decision. Again, Badger versus Manitoba AG. Leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada denied. The Ontario Court of Appeal, March 25, 1992, prisoners have the right to vote. Leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada granted. So, <laughs> consistency in administrative law has had a long history. But that, we don't stop there. The Federal Court of Appeal decided to get in the act in the case of Regina versus Belzowski on February 17, 1992, and they said, yes, prisoners have the right to vote. Leave to appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, granted. Now, the problem again becomes rather interesting because Parliament enacted the Referendum Act and directed the electoral officer to substitute the word referendum wherever the word election appeared in the Elections Act, except as to judges and the mentally incompetent. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the legislation says. But they did not, but they did not deal with prisoners. They did not deal with prisoners. The prisoners, therefore, the Elections Act, Section 51, as I recall it, said prisoners can't have the right to vote. But, it didn't end there. A pamphlet was issued by the um, referendum commissioner, and I quote, reading from his pamphlet relating to the referendum. Now, mind you, those judgments I referred to referred to right to elect at a federal election in respect of uh, election of problem. Didn't deal with a referendum. But now is what we, the electoral officer. And I quote, following Supreme Court judgments, judges and persons with mental disabilities 
are now eligible to vote in both referendums and elections at the federal level. <laughs> this also applies to prison inmates following recent judgments of the Federal Court of Appeal and the Ontario Court of Appeal. It doesn't matter that they weren't the same. <laughs> they, were, they were on opposite sides of the fence, but in any event, <laughs> any event that didn't matter. But again, it doesn't end there because I have searched diligently for the Supreme Court judgments and there aren't any. <laughs> there is a federal court judgment which said that um, uh, judges have the right to vote, which was undefended. And uh, uh, <laughs> there's, another, there's another judgment, of course, which says that mentally incompetents have the right to vote. Now, the difficulty with all that, not only isn't there any Supreme Court of Canada Supreme Court judgments, but those judgments are all based on Section 3 of the Charter. And Section 3 doesn't refer to referendums. So prisoners end up by having the right to vote, and as far as I'm concerned, quite illegally. So, <laughs> so much for consistency in administrative law. In any event, uh, I thought you'd be interested in the fact that uh, we do have, in my opinion, a need for uniformity in terms of uh, supervisory powers of um, federal boards and commissions. Um, in the area in which I spend most of my time, the field of intellectual property, it is especially important that uh, we have uniformity across the country and, uh, um, and as a result, uh, and to avoid the specter of different judgments in different provinces. It's chilling in the field of intellectual property. My next point I would like to make is the matter of judicial specialization. I suggest to you that we might have reached the stage in administrative law where we should consider, especially in the federal court trial division, a, a judge who would supervise administrative boards and um, uh, commissions and tribunals in the area of um, Specialization. I know that uh, a cynic will say that uh, what's the difference between knowing everything about nothing and nothing about everything. But uh, uh, haven't we reached the stage where we are now supervising those tribunals that do not have a judge connected with the tribunal uh, and uh, who do not necessarily uh, have the uh, background in administrative law uh, that is needed and isn't it time when they should be able to get guidance from a judge who has some special expertise in this field who will be available to make the judgment quickly? I have pending now a matter relating to uh, uh, a tribunal that was heard in February 1992. I haven't got a judgment yet in terms of purely a matter of practice. Now, what we need is something that will enable that tribunal to get guidance, it needed to guidance, quickly. Don't we need a, especially at the federal court trial level, trial division level, a uh, specialized judge to whom you can have recourse for consistency of judgments, for the guidance of that tribunal, and for a quick decision. Um, I don't comment in terms of um, the uh, provincial jurisdiction uh, because I think that some of the problems that are faced by the trial division and the federal court are not necessarily applicable uh, to the uh, provincial jurisdiction. But in any event, uh, uh, it seems to me that that is an area, especially in the federal court, that deserves consideration. You've heard Madam Justice Desjardins speak of um, the substantial amendments that have been made to the Federal, to the federal court, court Act. In view of the comments that are in Madam Justice Desjardins' paper as to the open questions, and in view of the amendments to the Immigration Act, uh, I can't help but be reminded of the old ditty that most of you will recall, which reads something like this, I'm the parliamentary draftsman. I compose the, com the country's laws. 
and of half the litigation, I'm undoubtedly the cause. <laughs> it, it seems to me, it seems to me that uh, what we've opened up is um, uh, an entirely new field of litigation. Uh, how, uh, in terms of the uh, difference in between sections 18 uh, and 28. Um, the old uh, basis of determination of this dichotomy was on the nature of the decision. It depended upon whether there was a judicial or quasi-judicial uh, determination. And of course that got up to the Supreme Court of Canada and bounced back and forth several times. It also depended upon whether an order had been made. It had to have been made in the past. The balance of the jurisdiction went to the trial division, primarily on the prerogative risk. And it was really, uh, I guess I can't do anything but use the vernacular, a dog's breakfast. Uh, now, we have an entirely different regime. It's the nature of the tribunal, as Madam Justice Desjardins has said, it depends upon whether there are 14, uh, one or other of 14 named, uh, named um, tribunals. Now, they, they are basically tribunals that have a uh, court or they uh, have a judge or they're a court of record. They will go to the federal, federal um, uh, court of appeal. The others will go to the trial division. Now, the difficulty with that, as Madam Justice Desjardins has said, the Federal Court of Appeal is now going to be listening, to, going to be hearing interlocutory matters, going to hear matters of original jurisdiction, as well as appellate jurisdiction. And as pointed out by Madam Justice Desjardins, they haven't yet decided what direction that's going to take, so I make no further comment on that. But again, it opens up an entirely new area of consideration. Um, one may say, well, of course, the, the uh, system in Ontario is much better, but my experience is that I ran into the same difficulty there, and a matter, an interlocutory matter, um, or rather, it shouldn't say interlocutory matter, it was a matter to remove a, to remove a solicitor. I didn't know whether it was final or interlocutory, so I appealed in both places. I got before the... Uh, before the single judge, he said you should be before the Court of Appeal. I got before the Court of Appeal, he said you should be before the single judge. So I didn't, I felt I was right at home. <laughs> in, in any event, uh, the uh, Court of Appeal decided that they would hear it, and that was the end of that. Uh, I mentioned that immigration matters have uh, imposed a tremendous burden, a tremendous burden on the court. And here again, we have in the federal court split jurisdiction. We have uh, uh, the, uh, as, and again, Madam Justice Dirjana's paper has spelled it out. But let me give you an order of magnitude of that difficulty. I'm told that there are 900 applications for leave to appeal, leave to appeal, filed before the court as of April 1992. Now there are 11 judges in the Court of Appeal. You can see the burden that's imposed on that court and the burden that's imposed on the uh, Federal Court Trial Division. It is, uh, uh, it is a real, the, the immigration burden is a real, real burden with split jurisdiction between the Federal Court trial division and the Federal Court of Appeal. Just a word, as my time is running out, on the grounds for review. I suggest you watch with care the direction in which uh, the two courts will be going. In the Federal Court, Federal Court Trial Division, the grounds for judicial review are specified. In the, as I read, the uh, provincial court jurisdiction, they're flexible. Now, time will tell which of the two is the more important, which of the two, or rather works in the public interest. But in any event, I commend you to watching that, uh, watching that development with some care. Just a word on the prerogative. Uh, 
whether or not uh, the, the amendments to the Federal Court Act has uh, enlarged the power and the jurisdiction of the court in terms of the prerogative and the paper written by Messrs. Uh, Whitehall and Smelly, which is referred to in uh, Madam Justice Dujardin's paper, you may wish to look at uh, a case that I have referred to in my paper, the Native Women's uh, Native Women um, Association versus the Queen of August 20, 1992, which is now subject to uh, further appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, as to the uh, where the Federal Court of Appeal did, as I understand it, give very wide scope to the jurisdiction of the court in relation to the matter of prerogatives, and you, of course, may also want, also want to look at Operation Dismantle in that context. I believe I've, uh, one other, just last comment as to procedure. I commend the, 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 the fact that the procedure has been simplified in the federal court. As again, Madam Justice DeJoyda has explained, Rule 16, Hundred has now enabled an application to be brought by originating notice rather than have to go through a declaration by statement of claim and originating notice in terms of the other relief. Been simplified, simple a matter of making an application, and this has been a move in the right direction. Uh, I think I've spoken over long, you know, Hudson. That's that's that. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, uh, indeed, Gordon. And we now turn as the uh, final commentator to uh, Robert Reed. Thank you. I thought Hudson got off to rather a bad start in introducing me when he suggested that my otherwise estimable te textbook was out of date. <laughs> I thought he redeemed himself somewhat, however, by um, referring to the new publication, which is very much up to date. <laughs> and which has been touted here now twice, once by John Laskin, once by Hudson, and three times, once by me. <laughs> <laughs> but what you don't know is that immediately after doing that, he turned to me and asked for 10% of the sales resulting from this meeting. <laughs> <laughs> We've all heard an excellent paper from Madame Justice Desjardins and vigorous, interesting reviews and comments from uh, Mr. Justice Blair and uh, Mr. Henderson. It's all been, for my personal consumption, useful and insightful. I shall, should feel pleasure in participating in this symposium, sitting at the feet of the stars of administrative law after all, I have learned a few new things. We have a new character who has emerged in administrative law. You've all heard of Calamity Jane. And some of you have heard of Damon Runyon's character, Nicely, Nicely Jones. But uh, until recently, you had never heard of, finally, Annisman. <laughs> <laughs> I think in future, he's going to be finally, finally Am Annisman. <laughs> but have you noticed how skillfully he interpreted the finality aspect of the word <laughs> absolutely consistently with administrative law. <laughs> finality provisions, as Gordon Blair made it clear in the foray for the Court of Appeal for Ontario, mean maybe. You <laughs> <laughs> can't read. Finally, finally, is getting towards finality. Unfortunately, the impression that I have received from listening to the speakers is one of intense gloom. I've had now some 42 years of reasonably intense involvement with administrative law. And it all reminds me of Rubik's Cube. Poke in one button and the other button pops up. I've got a rule called Reed's Rule for Administrative Law, and that is trying to make things better only makes them worse. <laughs> the federal court was an attempt to improve things, but the disaster of sections 28 and 18 has hamstrung it since its birth. 
It was a disaster that many people saw coming. Gordon got a headline, I didn't. They ignored me and they ignored Gordon, so absent the headline, I get the same kind of credit. Why they insisted on creating that conundrum is a mystery that was not solved in the recent commemorative uh, reception held in Ottawa. And most of us went down to hear who got blamed for the Section 1828 <laughs> problem, but uh, spent our time trying to figure out which, on which desk the buck had in fact landed. Nobody will fess up. Now, something that obvious should be cured immediately, shouldn't it? But it took 20 years until they got around to trying. And now they've finally done it. We have finally got major revisions to cure the problems posed by that unfortunate statute. But uh, having heard uh, Madam Justice Desjardins and Mr. Henderson, do you have any confidence that what used to be a dog's breakfast has not become a dog's dinner? <laughs> are things going to get better or are they going to get worse? The polite language used today suggests to me that they're going to get worse, that we have now created yet a new administrative law industry and more and more time will have to be spent by our admonishers from the academic profession, our teachers who are spengalying the Supreme Court of Canada, John Evans and David Mullen among them. I don't see how they're ever going to be able to put the pen down in trying to <laughs> instruct us on how to stick handle our way through the improvements to the federal court. Mr. Uh, Justice Heald, who is referred to on page 25 of Elise's paper, has said this, a reasonable prediction is that these ad additional grounds of review, and he's talking about the Court of Appeal, will present many practical problems for the Court of Appeal when exercising its original judicial review jurisdiction. Another point in her paper, Madam Justice Desjardins says the court will still be faced with the challenges outlined above and with defining the boundaries of judicial review for many years to come. That doesn't sound to me like much of an improvement, but what can you expect from people who can't tell the difference between little o and little p? <laughs> <laughs> the courts. <laughs> so for years we've been looking to the courts to cure the problems of administrative law. Administrative law, in my respectful but constant opinion, is a sick patient looking for a cure. I happen to have to read nearly all of the administrative law decisions, further plug for the publication by the way. <laughs> that come out of uh, the Canadian courts, certainly the ones that are written in English. And I can assure you, if you don't already know it, that they are contradictory, sometimes inscrutable, but mostly very, very disappointing. So we have a patient looking for a cure, but is it going to the right doctor? We go to the courts, yet almost everything that's been said in this symposium involves an acceptance of the present system, except for the comment that Gordon has recently made that we might hope for a specialist judge in the federal court to speed things up. Is it not the courts that are creating the problems? Do the problems not stem from the unrealistic expectations the courts have of the tribunals, the unrealistic demands they place upon them? Are the court's efforts to improve administrative justice not making the lives of administrators impossible? 
What about a few examples? Consolidated Bath and Trombley. Before those cases, what went on behind the closed door was not revealed. Certainly the courts didn't know, and there was little inclination on the part of the tribunals themselves to reveal just what collegiality meant in terms of discussing individual cases. The courts insist, however, on the independence of individual decision makers in the administrative system. Well, how does collegiality live with individuality? What we have now is a transfer to the tribunals of the court's own rule. The court's own insistence on individual independence in decision making. Well, how are you going to get any consistency when your task as a tribunal is to make as consistent an application of government policy as you possibly can? Are these two ideas not antithetical? Is this not an invitation to an individual member who may be new and untrained and intractable, <laughs> according to Margot, <laughs> to be irresponsible? unaccountable? How can the poor beleaguered chair in one of Margot's examples deal with the problem of the individual insistence on personal points of view, irrespective of how the policy the tribunal has been trying to develop over the years has been revealed in earlier decisions? Before Consolidated Bathurst, the fact that we did not have an ear into the discussion chamber was sometimes unsettling. But look what's happened. Now we're going to hear all about it. As a result, a direct result and a logical consequence of Consolidated Bathurst and Trombley, we have Ellis Dawn a new dawn <laughs> for administrative law. It's show and tell time for the tribunals. <laughs> Some of them are going to be cross-examined and dragged into court to reveal who said what to whom before the decision was published. How can we expect the tribunals to carry out their mandate under the threat of having decisions examined from stem to gudgeon. How can they make their thousands of decisions with reasonable dispatch? Courts increasingly expect tribunals to act like courts. Without any training or experience, they must find facts and determine the law. But do the courts help them? The courts severely restrict their access to even their own lawyers for guidance. The Lord help any tribunal which permits its own counsel to draft its reasons. Yet the courts demand that the reasons conform to guidelines the courts themselves have laid down for the tribunals. And now we have the Supreme Court of Canada suddenly revealing what they tell us we all should have known. And that is that administrative tribunals have a common law power to punish for contempt in facie. Have they? Should we have known it? News to me. And how does that square with the fundamental principle of administrative law that they have only the powers specifically granted by legislation? That's what we've been telling them for years. And now we've handed them the power to call the sheriff and have one or the other of you carted off to Durance Vile for impotence, I suppose. How are laid tribunals to go about exercising this kind of power? How are the tribunals whose membership is deliberately chosen to reflect different political and social points of view, such as those called upon to set rates for public utilities, to deal with the <coughs> Supreme Court of Canada's new bias rule, which is that you may be biased, but you mustn't have a closed mind. <laughs> My children think that I'm biased, and that means I've got a closed mind. <laughs> 
Is that not an impossible standard to impose on tribunals, or for that matter, on any rational human beings? These conundrums stem from the unreal relationship between courts and tribunals. So long as courts are responsible for supervising tribunals, they will impose their own standards on them. Why? Because they don't have any others. <laughs> they have no choice. They have no familiarity with administrative decision-making by and large. They're trained in a different system. So it's not surprising that as of the McCrewer report, tribunal decision-making has become more like courts. But this is a Procrustean solution. The one obvious fact about tribunals is that they are all different from each other. There's an enormous variety. But the courts are requiring them to follow one general code of procedure, a general code of procedure that the courts have followed for years. This, in my respectful opinion, ignores reality. It ignores the enormous differences between the essential nature of courts and the essential nature of administrative decision makers. Unlike courts, hearings and tribunals are not an end in themselves. They're customarily merely part of the process of regulating. The courts don't regulate. Yet the process of regulating involves adherence to a defined policy. To confer upon a new and untrained member, as I've said before, the state is to ignore that policy in the name of independence is to shoot the tribunal in the kneecaps. It's bound to come a cropper. Equally, to try to warp the concept of bias, and I'm talking about a case we haven't discussed here, but this is Newfoundland Telephone, and you're all probably familiar with it. The courts properly apply them to themselves. Sorry. Equally, to try to warp the concept of bias that the courts properly apply to themselves to the administrative tribunals is, in my respectful opinion, to fail to understand certain truths about tribunals. That every tribunal member must be biased in favor of a policy, that particular policy, that particular court, uh, tribunal was set up to enforce. And that some tribunals are deliberately composed of people committed to different points of view for good political reasons. Now, this is not the place for a general review of the inadequacies of the present system. But is it a system? To, to paraphrase Dr. Johnson, the wonder is not that it works badly. It is that it works at all. Judicial review, in my opinion, is a very poor way to run a railroad. The Mercure reforms in Ontario and the like elsewhere They've taken some of the wrinkles out of the procedure. But as the procedure becomes easier, the jurisprudence becomes harder, more sophisticated, and convoluted, and we expect the tribunals to understand it. If David Mullen and John Evans can't explain it to me in terms that I can understand it, then I have certain sympathy with the tribunals. This raises the question whether the system itself is not the cause of the problems rather than the solution to them. If there's anything in what I've said, and I've said it now for 45, 42 years, sorry, without any effect whatsoever, this may be my last chance, or my final chance, which means that I'll be, <laughs> which means that I'll be back next year. <laughs> How then can we arrange for supervision of administrative decision-making by people who are sensitive to its needs? and aware of its problems. It's time for serious consideration of administrative appeal courts, staffed by judges selected for their expertise and understanding of the problems and the processes of administrative decision making, as well as the need for fairness in the process. Failing that, let's try to make sure that at least some of the judges are appointed on the basis of their expertise and experience and given the opportunity to exercise it or that courts encourage judges to take an interest in administrative law if they are willing to do so and give them the opportunity to exercise that interest. What are we going to do, for instance, when Gordon Blair retires from the Ontario Court of Appeal? What a source of comfort he was to those of us in the divisional court. He's the author of the most significant decision that's come out of the Ontario courts 
the 4A decision, which expresses exactly the philosophy he's just told us about today, and is, in my opinion, the result of his experience, which was outside the normal experience of litigation counsel who are typically appointed to the courts. Let's try to make sure that he is replaced when he must retire, as we all must sooner or later, except for those of us who jump out before our time, with someone of equal caliber. Where are we going to find them? Well, I can think of five or six sitting in this room staring at me right now. People whose background and experience and inclination would fit them for the task. Can we leave this to the legislators? Not if the Federal Court of Appeal is any example. I'm sorry, not if the Federal Court is any example. Mm -hmm. How the Federal Court judges have lived their lives, uh, given the problems that were imposed upon them, I simply do not know. I can only stare at them in wonder. The courts left to themselves without any real assistance from anybody are, in my opinion, trying to improve things. We are, I think, fortunate in Ontario, in spite of its inadequacies, which I have often complained about, the Divisional Court is, in my opinion, a great step forward. And all you have to do is to read the decisions in other provinces where people are still stumbling over mandamus and prohibition and certiorari, and in fact, at the highest level, throwing people out of court because they didn't use the word mandamus in the piece of paper that started the proceeding, and this has, in fact, happened. We don't have that here anymore. We are getting, we've got rid of most of the procedural problems. The court itself, according to my information, is reforming itself as much as it can. The Divisional Court is now chosen from a list of people, of judges, who wish to sit on the court and who have some expertise, some of it uh, very large and extensive but at least an inclination to sit there, and they are now permitted to sit for longer terms than when I was there. And so we have to thank that court for moving in the right direction. But surely it should be a separate court with specialized judges devoted to administrative law. I have the slightest hesitation, and I've heard the argument for generalist judges over the years, I have the slightest hesitation in saying that that, in my opinion, would be a great step forward. Why don't we face up to the need for one? It's been discussed for years. The time is now. Thank you. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, I think we've had a, a, a very excellent major paper and a very good uh, comment. The day is uh, proceeding. Uh, I think we want to get out of here before, uh, before dusk. Therefore, what I'm going to suggest is as follows. Um, could we take a break, uh, but not leave the room? Could we call on David Mullen to come down? And could you join me, uh, please, in thanking uh, Madam Justice De, uh, uh, Desjardins and the commentators for a very stimulating uh, afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you.